Um, yeah, for those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Stephen. Um, I study civil engineering at the University of Wollongong, and I have the privilege of reading from the Word of God today. Um, we're reading Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son in his earthly life. He was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them, so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his own people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to my God, whom I serve with all my heart, by spreading the good news about his Son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come to you to see you. For I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want, you, I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people both in the civilized world and the rest of the world to talk to the educated and uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome too, to preach the good news. This is the word of God. So this piece of paper coming around now is a little summary. Um, Romans has lots of chapters, I think about 16 last time I checked. And it's quite a long book to read. If you sit down and read it out loud, it'll probably take about three hours to read through Romans, I reckon. And so this is a way for us to know where we are in the book. It's like a map. It's like having Google Maps switched on. Um, so that when you open the book to, I don't know, chapter 10 or something, you know what's going on around you. So I think most people have got it now. Um, and yeah, as you can see, there are different lines through here that are about different sections of the book of Romans. And... Um, on the right hand side you can see there's these two orange um, lines that are Paul, the person who is writing the letter, his, his introduction or he's talking about his message and mission and then at the very end of the letter you can see that orange colour coming back and Paul is basically writing a goodbye and signing off um, to talk about his plans and the people or partners um, that he's working with for the gospel around the world. But in the middle, it's not really about Paul, it's really about God's plans and God's work among the church. And so we, we're going through topics like God's power and God's anger and God's grace and God's assurance, God's plan and God's community. So those are the sorts of topics that we'll be talking about. And you can see the funny arrows, um, the up and down arrow is a part of the um, letter where we're talking about our relationship with God. So we talk about that as a vertical relationship. And then there's the one that points all different ways, and that's about God deciding who is going to be his people. And then there's the one that goes horizontally, and that's talking about how the gospel impacts our relationships with each other. So as we go through, you might want to put this on your fridge or the back of your toilet door or inside of your Bible or somewhere useful where you spend some time and just keep coming back to it and asking, where am I up to? Now, this is an introduction. Um, it's not a lecture, it's a sermon, but it's an introduction talk 
And today we are not going to go home with like four things to do, okay? Today it's more let's get excited kind of time, all right? And so what are we going to get excited about? Well, we're going to get excited about the sorts of things that the first few verses bring before us. And um, so I get to have a bit of fun today and I get to explore some ideas with you before we get right into the Bible study. So has anyone here actually been to Rome or to Italy where Rome, the country where Rome is located? Give us a wave if you've been there. Yeah, right. Now, anyone is free to participate in this question. Has anyone eaten any Italian food in their lives? Yes. I thought you might say yes. So um, my wife, she's been to Rome and she said there's this kind of pizza that they call calzoni and it, you fold it over on top of itself and she reckons that's one of the best foods in the world. Um, so I'm going to give you a chance just to call out what are some of the things that you like about uh, Italian food, culture, anything like that. Um, I'll let you know now that one of my children think that I work for the Italian Mafia, and it's not true. I do not work for the Mafia. Um, but um, what is it about Italy, Italian culture um, or, or anything to do with Rome, if you visited there, that you've noticed? Lots of history, Andrew says, yes? Oh, yeah, what's the name of the football team? Uh huh. Right. Yes. Gnocchi, beautiful pasta. Mm. The roads, all leads lead. All roads lead to Rome. They say. But that's because Rome built them in the first place. They actually have a lot of older people. And they live a long time despite eating lots of pizza and pasta. <laughs> Very good. Sorry, say that again. Oh, the Colosseum. Yes, pictured here on the slide behind me. What's important about the Colosseum? What happened there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, people used to fight um, and there was lots of entertainment. And so and it, it was big enough for almost the whole city to sit there and watch these, these fights. They had gladiators and things. What was that? The Vatican. Yes. If you know about the Catholic Church, then that's the head office for the Pope. Yep. Very good. Which is, te te the Vatican City is technically a separate part. It's just like Canberra's not really part of Australia. No, I'm just saying, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> Canberra's not really part of New South Wales, even though it's in the middle of New South Wales. Uh, all right, we're getting a bit mean now. Sorry about that, Paula's sister. Anyone else? Ferrari, Ferrari yes. Fast cars and cool cars too, and motorbikes, I might say. Yes. All right, I think we've investigated Italian culture nicely there. Um, so we've got a map that we can show you. Um, there it is with the pin stuck into it. It's, um, I think Italy is, is actually like a, a foot. Yeah. Um, so other people can describe their country as, I don't know how you describe Australia. I've heard China described as a chicken. Yeah, the Chinese talk about their country as a chicken. That's, yeah, a common thing. Um, so we've got a foot here. Let's go on to the next one. Right, now I don't expect you to read this, but this is the first thing that was said, and that is there's a lot of history uh, here in this city called Rome. And uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of the dates with you if you're a date kind of a person. And so the very first... Um, township of Rome was goes back to about 700 years before Jesus, 750 BC. And um, then it started to grow. And so by um, about 500 BC, it starts to be a bigger area and have some strength. And by about 275 BC, actually that 
whole area of Italy is basically under, the, under control of Rome and the power of Rome continues to expand. Um, so by about 100 BC, it's pretty big and it's starting to gobble up countries around it. Uh, Julius Caesar, you might have heard of him, in the 50 BC kind of area, he conquered Gaul, which is an old name for the place of France, right? So you can now see how big this thing is becoming. And the first official emperor of Rome was around 27 BC. Now, Jesus was born, they say, around about 4 BC. So we're very close to the time of Jesus when the first emperor is happening. And um, that Colosseum that we looked at at the beginning um, was actually constructed around sort of 70. It was finished around 79 AD. Um, so now that, Jesus died and was killed around about AD 30. So that we're talking about 40 or 50 years after Jesus' death. Um, that that Colosseum was actually built and at that time there was a nasty emperor called Nero and he was really into kind of suffering and causing pain to people. Uh, a lot of Christians suffered under his time and so you can imagine that that Colosseum was a place of great cruelty. And then um, the gospel started to spread and it started to change things in the Roman Empire and actually by about the year 300 AD, the very first emperor became a Christian and that emperor's name is Constantine or Constantine um, and then about a hundred years later Romans split into east and west and the first part of that fell in about 476 and then other parts of the Roman Empire continued on for actually a really long time. So um, a lot of people go around saying that Rome is an empire um, that lasted a thousand years and when you think about it there are not many empires that have lasted anywhere near a thousand years right the British Empire very short what other empires have we got I mean the old ones are things like the Babylonian Empire and the Assyrian Empire um, the, it, the Egyptians ruled lots of things for a while but not very few countries have been able to rule for a thousand years so Rome is a very impressive place even if you're just a historian and not a Christian. But when you're a Christian, Rome is an even more special place uh, for reasons that we'll get to as we go through Romans. So, are you pumped to get into this book of Romans, this book that's about this amazing place in time and space? And uh, what I want to do is just now go through a few of the ideas and the references in the first part of Romans. So if we can go on to that next slide, you can see I've put a postage stamp in the corner and I don't know the last time that you actually wrote a physical letter and put it in the post box and the little postman came and collected it and the little truck drew, drove around and the airplane did its thing and your letter arrived wherever you sent it. Does anyone, has anyone sent a letter in the last 12 months? A few of you have. So you know what I'm talking about. It's like horses and carriages these days, isn't it? But there's, there are some things we do to letters, to letters. We write on the front, we write the name and the address of the person we're sending it to. And on the back, we actually write the person who is sending it and, and, a, and a return address, just in case there's a problem delivering this letter. We put the, st the stamp on it, which is our way of paying the people who are taking the letter for us. And sometimes we do this crazy thing where we decorate the letter, okay? Um, so I think there, there's still a letter up on our joy wall and that's got a love heart on it. And so that one is a decorated letter. Now, as we go through um, Romans, what we find is that the first few verses are doing the same thing as what we write on the envelope. So verse one, this letter is from Paul the Apostle Paul, and he describes himself a little bit here. He doesn't just leave it as a name. He's a slave of Christ Jesus, and he's chosen by God to be an apostle, and he's sent out to preach the good news. Now, that's actually saying lots about Paul. A bit unusual that he describes himself as a slave of Jesus, Right? Did you wake up this morning and think, I'm a slave of Jesus? I did because I woke up super early for Jesus. Um, but 
maybe you, you had a nice day on the beach and you didn't think much about serving Jesus. Um, he's chosen um, by God to be an apostle. He's, he's been sent as, actually as a witness of Jesus and his resurrection. That's an unusual thing. We can't all say that. And he's sent out to preach the good news. And so verse 1 gives us lots of clues. And then when we drop down to verse 9... Wow, verse 7, uh, everyone in Rome, it's sent to the recipient, everyone in Rome, but not just everyone, everyone who is loved by God and chosen by God. Put your hand up if you're loved by God and chosen by God, yeah? Well, I, I hope as time goes by, you can say, everyone in this room can say yes to that. Um, and if you're here, it's a pretty good indication that God is at work in your life one way or another. And I want to tell you that you are loved by God. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful thing to have that assurance that you're actually part of his people. So this letter is actually to kind of us, um, originally to the people in Rome who follow Jesus. And now I think we can read this and take on the words for ourselves. But this envelope has decorations of a special kind. It's not... It's not that mushy kind of love letter, right? We used to write, us old people, we used to write S-W-A-K on the back of an envelope. Do you know what that stands for? You know, Paula, don't you? Sealed with a kiss. Oh, please pass the bucket, right? Um, so you lick, the, you lick the envelope like that and, and then you, you put a love heart on it and write sealed with a kiss. Oh, yuck. Um, it's not that kind of a letter, but there is a theme that's going on here and we can see that on this next slide and as we read through the different verses. In verse 3, there's this theme that we start to find called the good news. The good news is about, oh, let's go back to, to verse 1. Paul is sent to preach the good news. And then in verse 2, God promised the good news long ago. And verse 3 the good news is about his son, Jesus. And then even as we go on through the different verses, there's a focus on what that good news is, what happened to Jesus and why it's good news. And verse 5, he has the job of spreading this good news. And as we go on, he prays about the good news. And so the good news keeps coming up. This is a theme that is clearly, obviously driving his message. Now, in the original Greek language, it was euangelion. See, I speak Greek. I don't speak much Greek, but I speak that. Euangelion. Euan, like eulogy, we speak good, we say nice things, euan, it, and then galleon is like message. So it's a good message. It's good news. And in English, we say gospel. So everywhere where you see good news, some Bible translations will say gospel. And that's because it's not just any old good news. It's not like, congratulations, you won a beauty contest, receive $10. This is the best news you can possibly get. By the way, that was a reference to a game called Monopoly um, and it's second prize in the beauty contest. But <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> I got distracted. This is the best news you can possibly get. There's only one set of good news from God and it is the gospel news about Jesus. It's one of a kind. And so even before we've got very far into this letter, we know that God has something really, really good to say. So we're going to call that gospel extremely good news, right? If anyone says, what's the good news? What's the gospel again? It's extremely good news from God. Now, all through, um, through this series, we're going, to, we're going to be talking about some big words and we're trusting you. Even if you're new to English, it's okay, we'll be kind, but we are going to use some big words as we go through Romans because we want to introduce you to some theology for a special reason. We also want to have a bit of fun. So I'll show you some things that I prepared. Um, so this is one of the things that I prepared. It's a travel brochure, as you can clearly see, 20% off 
and who wouldn't want 20% off to go to Italy? In fact, my wife and I, we're travelling to Italy in May next year for a holiday, and it's my first time to visit Rome. I'm really looking forward to that. But if you read a bit more, you can see exclusive Rome insights. And that's actually what the Book of Romans is. It's, there's some exclusive insights that only here we hear from God. But then on the, in the fine print, spec, special packages include a resurrection package, right? And a Christology guarantee. That's talking about Jesus and how Jesus guarantees some things. Our life insurance is complimentary. And that's, again, thinking about our life and how Jesus saves our life. Um, so we'll be putting th some things like that up. So if you brought something along and put it on the joy wall, it's time to take that home with you, okay? That special thing that you've shared with your church family. We want you to take it down and we want to, take, we want to start putting some new things up for our new Roman series. And so let's go through some words. So what is the, what is the gospel again? No, it's not good news. It's extremely good news. Okay, that's our special KI Church definition. Okay, good news is okay. But if you say extremely good news, you go to the top of the class. All right? Um, so you've got that that's good news from God and it's about Jesus. Then there's a word up here, theology. Now let's break that up into two words. I think it's probably Latin rather than Greek. Theo is about God. Well done. And ology, it's kind of the study of or information about. Yes, so this is God information or a knowledge of God. And you might even go so far as to say the love of God, right? Theology. Now, some of us have old theology books on our bookcases. I'm looking at Simone and Glenn and people like that. And they might have old dusty books where people argue with each other about little words and things. That is not what we're on about when we talk about theology. We are talking about how good is God. He has made himself known. We can understand God. We can love him back, right? This is living, wonderful theology and Romans is full of this knowledge and this information and it's meant to be part of us. And we're meant to be people who think, right? It's an intelligent thing to be a Christian. And we actually have to stretch our mind and think to understand some things that God has told us about Jesus, right? So, theology. Now, does anyone want to have a guess what Christology might be? Yell it out, yell it out. The study of Christ. What's Christ again? Oh, that's right. That's one of Jesus' titles, meaning king. So Christ is, means king, and it's especially a Jesus title. Um, so we are, when we talk about Christology, we are talking about the knowledge of Jesus. Right. Now, in time, we'll put that up on the wall when you take your bits and pieces home. So as you read through these first few verses in Romans, what do we learn? What do we, what, how do we add to our Christology? If Christology was a toolkit and we're picking up little bits of information and putting them in our toolkit, which parts have we just learned? Right? How has our knowledge of Jesus grown? Well, he has servants, right? One of them was Paul. Uh, he was promised to come from a long time ago through the prophets. And Jesus is described as being descended from King David. And it turns out that that's an important piece of information because that God made certain promises to King David and those promises are going to be fulfilled through Jesus. Jesus is also described as a son of God. And the argument that the Bible gives for Jesus being God's son here is actually the demonstration of God's power through the resurrection of Jesus from being dead to being alive. And so our Christology toolbox is starting to fill up and 
as we go through this series, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of the things, um, and some of the ways that people understand God, theology, these big words. We have the humanity of Jesus in view. He's descended from David. He is fully man. But we also have the divinity, right? The godness of Jesus in view. He is fully divine. And so these are the, some of the things that we talk about when we talk about theology and we talk about Jesus or Christology. Jesus is the man God. If you've got any questions about that, just ask Jason after the service. He would love to help you. Um, <laughs> love you, mate. Um, Jesus is fully God and fully man. And that makes him uniquely a person who can help us. He's uniquely a person who can uh, die for sin, who can defeat sin and death, who can speak to God on our behalf and help us, um, who can send the Holy Spirit to us. There's lots of things that Jesus can do that no one else can do, right? Jesus, he's really cool. He deserves a Ferrari and sunglasses, but he's not interested in those things. He's interested in your heart, actually, and your life and your future. And that's what he's invested in. And the central claim of even now, just a few verses in, is this resurrection claim. And as our friends think about Jesus, one of the things they're going to have to think about is the resurrection of Jesus. Is there life after death? And is it possible that Jesus might have actually gone from being dead to being alive? Because if that's true, and we have a lot of witnesses who say it is, then it's possible that you and I, too, might share in his resurrection, that his resurrection power might work for us too. And there's some things in here about why it's so important that we believe and obey, obey Jesus in a way we become his disciples. So, would you agree that we're talking about something enormous and wonderful, that this is extremely good news and the little words there, um, grace and peace to you, mean so much, right? Grace is an undeserved kindness. Now, that's nice enough if we have undeserved kindness for each other, but if God has undeserved kindness for you, that's incredible news. That's awesome. And if God can give you peace, even with all the things that are wrong in the world, that's awesome news too. So what I wanted to do today is just open it up and for you to get a bit excited and join with me in this learning experience as we hear the message of Romans, as we grab hold of God's incredibly good news and as we find ourselves being on the receiving end of God's kindness. Romans is a wonderful journey. You've got a roadmap on your knees Come back next week and we'll get into that gospel message that we've talked about today. And um, if you're really keen, read ahead. Read ahead in Romans and think about some of the things you're reading. It'll be good if you could read, I don't know, two chapters a week or maybe three chapters a week. That would be about right. And then you'll finish at about the same time as us. And if you um, want a freebie, then me, Pastor Pete, We'll buy you a coffee if you can remember this verse, verse 5, okay? We're going to end with this verse, but the deal is, I will buy you a coffee at the cafe of your choice, right? If you choose Rome, you have to provide the airfares, okay, and I'll provide the coffee. Uh, but um, all you have to do is learn this and then say it back to me next week without cheating, and I, you, I will owe you a coffee. Um, so it, what it says, through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles, this is the important bit, to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them, so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. What incredibly good news.